Thank you all for coming. It's nice that you're here. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm just so happy to see Claire. We haven't seen each other for some years because of uh, problems with travel, etc. So I'm just so thrilled to get to see her. Thank you, Jim. You Same know, here. You know, we've known each other now, I was counting, it's like 37 years or something like that. And uh, what that means is we're old. Yeah. <laughs> but what it also For means, sure. yeah, word, word to you to you young people, shit goes by fast. So, <laughs> But the good thing about that, I was thinking is, oh man, how many incredibly beautiful films has Claire made, you know? So what a, what a gift. I don't know where to start except that you said before, and it's very true from all your work, that you don't have a tr trajectory. Like you never start with a plan of your career or anything like that. You go by what inspires you. And your newest film, I don't know how many people got to see the film. So, some of you did, both sides of the blade. Uh, it was shown last night, a really, really strong film. And I'm just going to blabber for a minute first because I, I, I got to meet Juliette Binoche last night, who I've never met, but I'm a huge fan at the dinner. I stole her place card. <laughs> I'm keeping that. And I was talking to her and I said, Juliette, man, you know, Claire makes you do some really weird shit. She, <laughs> and she, I said, you know, you have to fuck robots and stuff. <laughs> and Juliet said... You know, fucking the robot was the pleasurable part. This, this last film was really difficult. So anyway, she is a fearless actor, but this new film, she is incredible. It's just an amazing film. Um, I don't know what my question is in that, um, but it's more about every, f this film came about while Claire was preparing another film that she's been working on. Um, quite some time that I want to talk about also, uh, which is The Stars at, at noon, noon, which is based on a, a beautiful novel, I won't use that word, but a, a great novel by Dennis Johnson. But this is something that happened before when Claire was preparing High Life. Um, I, I don't know if I'm correct about this, but you had troubles and then you just went ahead and made Let the Sun Shine In in between. And this film also, so man, you're relentless. You can't stop her. So could you just tell me a little bit about how, you know, how both sides of the blade came about? Um, first of all, I thank you very much, Jim. It, as I told you before, I was so shy to know you were going to, to be here on the stage with me. I was afraid because you teach me to look for crawfish. <laughs> in the forest. In we, we hunted crawfish yeah. in Louisiana <laughs> a long time ago. And, that's, and you opened my mind so much when I was working with you. I felt the world was opening. Um, such, um, you gave me a sort of confidence. And uh, you, you show me also the happy moment of filmmaking, like the fork, the fucking fork effect, things like that I never forget since then, you know? Because I'm not a very funny person, I'm basically anxious and sad. It's my base, you know? <laughs> no, it's true, it's, it, I'm smiling, but it's the real truth, you know? So to be, what happened with this film, both sides of the blade, also sometimes called fire. <laughs> but I, I was doing nothing, first close down of COVID, and it was summer. I was cooking every day, new recipe. I, was, I could not write a script. I was blocked by a food scene, you know? I, was, I had to cook. I was doing hummus every day. So, and Vincent uh, Landon, the actor, called me Great and said... actor who's in the film. Yeah. He said, you cannot stay home and uh, 
cooking all the time. It's insane. <laughs> Please, I, in, you can write a, a story in, during the summer, and we can shoot in the winter. I said, oh, no, 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 I can't. Say, yes, we don't know what the future is going to be, so please do it. And he wanted to meet Juliet, so somehow things went easier than I thought. The Christine Ango is a writer. She is not a script writer, she's a novelist, and she said, I have no time, I'm too tired. Maybe we can look in my last novel. It's about, I knew her last novel. So we took, the main thing is that she says, she explained in that novel how hard it was to uh, meet in a street an ex-lover. That's really the matter of the novel. And we start on that, you know. An ex-lover who had dropped her, and she still, f she was still feeling the, the abandon and the pain and the humiliation of it, you know, in a way. And we, it transformed it for Vincent and Juliette, and also for Grégoire Collin, an actor I work with long time ago when he Nelette was... Bonny. Yeah. I met him when he was um, 16, I guess, you know. So it was like a... And Bulogier, it was like a little group of people I knew and with the production and the producer find a way to build... Uh, to arrange a budget for the film because it was too late to get uh, the commission money. And we did it fast. And, and I was not even realizing I was, it went so fast. And I was doing that, that film before I would be able to do the other film, Stars at Noon, you know. It was like, I thought maybe Stars at Noon will never exist. So maybe this is my last film. I don't know, it was a weird thing. And I think Juliette and Vincent were like the engine of this thing, you know. Um, they were like a tank, and I was on the top of the tank with... Uh, the DP, and we were trying to follow them, you know. It was really amazing, that, their energy. It's, it's, I love how it's shot, too. All, always your films have amazing cinematography. But the, it's always connected. It's just part of the story. It's never slapped on top. It never has its own kind of um, attention drawn. It's, it's always serving the purpose and you've worked with, obviously, <coughs> with Agnes Godard for many years, but other DPs, and, and it always is at the purpose of the, the story and the atmosphere. And you're always observing people, you know, in these films. I read somewhere once that you said something about, like, you don't believe, you don't like thinking about the devil making people do things. The devil's always something inside them. It's not outside of them. And this film's a really good example of that, if you haven't seen it. But uh, I don't want to say any really anything more about it myself, except like last night I said my main comment about this film is, damn, people are complicated. <laughs> but it's really a... It is true. <laughs> it is and, true. Yeah. You know. the, the thing is, maybe I should say... Both actors, Vincent and Juliette, and also Grégoire, um, they took the story, uh, they brought it to them, you know, and, and they were stronger than the, street, the script, I must say, and we were running after them, you know. Um, 
Yeah, it, and working with Eric Gauthier for the first time, Eric Gauthier is a DP, I knew him for years, never worked with him. It was like, um, it was like uh, driving together, you know, driving a small car by the tank, you know, <laughs> and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I really enjoyed it, and I never think what is the kind of image for a film? You know that, Jim, because you're such an example. But I mean, this is something I like, like all director, I think, to decide if it's um, the format. And the only thing I like to rely on is the lens, because then I feel secure if I, no, we, we will use two, three lens, no more. I, I hate the idea to choose a lens on the set. It's better if it's in my head um, while writing. I think it helped me to think, to choose a lens on the set, it, it, I feel like a sort of guiltiness, you know? I've not done my homework or something like that, you know? I, I like to think, a little bit, it's helping too. And I think um, you know that, of course. Well, I like to be limited by having yeah. a small yeah. number of lenses. And yeah. I, I always look to Ozu, who used really one lens yeah. always. So he did, yeah, he didn't feel guilty. Yeah. No. <laughs> or Just put the lens what, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe he was drinking, though. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> And me, I stopped smoking, so... <laughs> when did you stop? Five years ago. Ah, I got ten years, too. And it's really... Tobacco. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in a way, I think... I, I love to film Vincent smoking on the balcony. For me, this was the best moment in, in, in the film, you know? When Vin scene where Vincent smoked lightning a cigarette on the balcony. It, it's my dream still today, <laughs> to smoke on the balcony, you know? Yeah. No, it's true. I mean, for someone who has been smoking, it's part of my best memories in life, a cigarette, you know? I, I'm not joking, I'm serious, you know? And I know Isaac is somewhere in this room, and I remember Coffee and cigarette with Isaac a long time ago. Yeah. I sm yeah. <laughs> I'm drifting off thinking about smoking. I remember once Tom Waits told me that before he quit smoking, when he smoked heavily, he used to set his alarm clock when he went to sleep for four hours <laughs> so he could get up and have a cigarette and then go back to sleep. He said, yeah, I don't like to go eight hours without... <laughs> Pretty intense addiction, yeah, yeah. though. I'm I'm happy to n not have that addiction. But. Well, uh, on that note, where do we go from here? <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, the The beginning of the film. Just just talk about this film for a second, because we're talking about limiting lenses and the idea of uh, limitations and using them as strengths, which you you have always kind of done. Um, and, and it makes a kind of more pure way of making films. Um, this film, you shot the, there's an opening sequence in water, they're swimming. It's very, very sensual and very blue. And, and you shot it on a cell phone, right? This yeah. opening. Yeah, this, this part of the film was, the opening was not in, in the budget. And, together with the producer and Vincent and Juliette, we decide to go. And five, four or five of us with a cell phone. And it was end of November, the only place in France where you have a little bit of sun and a possible blue sea is Corsica. So we went there, but already it was very, it was freezing, but sunny. And Juliette and Vincent stand in that cold water, and me and Eric 
too. We were, I was holding Eric because he, he's not very heavy, so he was floating, so I was <laughs> holding him. No, it, and it was, so I don't mean, I felt very happy to do, to do it like that. Like, at least it was a, not freedom, but almost a, a little secret between us, you know? We, we've done it. Yeah. Well, The Stars at Noon, you know, I know you've been wanting to make that into a film for quite a long time. Ten um, years? Mm -hmm. And you sort of switch off between uh, adapting things or writing them from inspirations. For, for example, 35 Shots of Rum is inspired by Ozu's film, Late Spring. Yeah. Um, and one of your films... More than inspire, almost copy. <laughs> but I, I, I love that so much, when you take something that moves you and then make it your own, but it's something very interesting about your work, because you don't have a signature, you, exactly, because you work in, you subvert various genres, you like adapting other people's writing, but then it, it's something you make from it. It's like, I, I love that Sam Fuller used to say, you know, I write with a camera. And <laughs> you do that too, in a way. Um, because I don't have the same voice. <laughs> no. Well, you, you need to smoke a lot of cigars, you know. I write with a goddamn camera, Claire. <laughs> but um, so it, it's really interesting to me because your films always seem like your films, and yet they're all incre incredibly different. But there's something, you know, and this is nonsense, because I'm not analytical, and I don't know what I'm saying exactly. <laughs> but if you're a fan of her films, you do know what I'm saying, because there's always something, the way she chooses to observe things and build a, a story is very much her own, and yet they come from very different inspirations. So. Where's the question in that, Jim? I don't know. I, I, I can answer for 35 Shots of Rum because it started when I saw Late Spring. It was a summer in Paris. There was a retrospective of Ozu. And new print, beautiful. I, every night I was going... Um, watching a film, and late spring, of course, was like uh, receiving a harrow in my heart because my grandfather was a, a widower and he raised my mother on his own. He never wanted to marry again. And he raised my mother uh, in a way so cautiously, you know, it was during the war the Second war, war, World War, and I remember that grandfather like, um, not a saint, but a man with not many words, but such a strong emotional, strong love, you know. His love was imposing on me when I was a little girl. He was still in a way commanding my mother, you know. And my father was terrified by him, you know. Um, and I saw that film and I, and I took my mother to see Late Spring and she was in tears because she immediately recognized and I think I felt allowed to stall the, the story, you know, because it was a little bit behind and I... I made it with um, Alex Escas and Mati Diop and Grégoire Collin also. It was also a family film, you know. And Mati Diop is in the new film as well. She's, yeah. she's fantastic. And talking about your grandfather and his, his love um, made me think there, there are two things in the new film, two people very close to my heart, and one is Boulogier. Yeah. who plays a grandmother who's very loving and careful and very sweet, you know. Yeah. But uh, 
And then, then you have a brief clip. We have some music by Yasmin Hamdan, yeah. who I also yeah. love. Uh, the, I was thinking of you. But those two people are very close to me, so yeah. I was very happy to have both of them. Yeah. But, you know, you also, uh, in Bastards, you, you were inspired by Kurosawa's film, The Bad Sleep Well. Is that true? Yeah, yeah it's true. It's true, but then I couldn't go. Um, I, I was, I'm not as solid as Kurosawa, maybe something, uh, I had to change a little bit. Uh, Kurosawa, those films made by Kurosawa at that time, those terrible films he made, those five, six films he made, um, were so s strong in a way, imposing so much on me that, I would have been a little bit afraid to be that, I mean, that I, you know. No, but, I know what you mean. I know what you mean about Kurosawa. Uh, it's uh, very uh, strong, you know. Yeah, and it's, it's so definite, you know. The low and the high, the, you know, it, it's always this and that, you know. And me, I'm always... <laughs> trying to stay in the middle in a, a little bit, you know? Yeah. I'm not that brave, I guess. <laughs> so you won't be remaking Throne of Blood. I think so. It's probably a good no. thing. <laughs> you heard it here first. Um, you know, you're, you're French, but you're not French in a way to me because you're more Belgian. No, you, no, because you grew up in Africa and you grew up moving around and your father moved you around and uh, you were exposed to cultures that are not French and you were also, from a very young age, able to see and understand colonialism and its effects and things that other French people um, are kind of kept away from, you know? So I just find... Again, I don't know where the question is in this, but you are, you know, you, I have you an are. An answer. Okay, good. <laughs> thank you. Because Isaac is here, Isaac de Bocolé. Because when I did my first film, Chocolat, I was, uh, I knew Isaac from stage, and I admire him very much, and he accepted to be in my first film, and some other. Uh, African, not French African, but some African or Caribbean actor living in France hated the story and the script. They pretend they, they told me, no, 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 we cannot be uh, a servant in a story taking place in Africa in this colonial time. And Isaac was so free and open, he said, but of course, you know. And he was there like um, uh, the light for me in that, that film, you know. Without Isaac, I would not have done the film. Because Isaac understood everything in my um, small um, intervention about colonialism. It was a little bit naive maybe, but I wanted, I thought if I have to do films, then maybe I have to say something about where I come from. This is my answer. But you, sit, but you are a kind of outsider in a way that is in your work in the observational way that I, I don't, I don't see you really judging the characters, you are just presenting them. And you've made some films with some brutal characters and some so some nasty situations between people emotionally. And uh, so I always see you as not, as being somehow able to look from outside a little bit. And I don't know if that's from, you know, coming, being French, but not being French in that kind of way, I don't know. But again, maybe it's not something to analyze. It's more I'm just observing it myself rather than... But I have, uh, I have a feeling maybe, maybe... I'm sorry, I interrupt you. No. I have a feeling maybe something, things I can't stand because I don't have a sense of humor 
I am not a funny person. I, I, I'm. But you laugh at funny things. You have oh, a good course. sense of humor. I, 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 the little I dark love and. I laugh at your jokes. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> me, but the thing that are revolting for me is humiliation. I can't stand it. This is like something I would prefer. I am able to do horrible things if I see somebody humiliated. This is something I am not... Uh, life is not so long, you know, so at least it's good to have one or two things you can hang on, you know. And... Um, that's why I have a problem with film that are uh, uh, describing social case, like the society is able to regenerate, you know. I don't believe in that. I think society is cruel, the world is cruel, and film exists to be, to tell a little bit of that, I think, even without sense of humor like I have, I think it's a little bit of contribution I can do. I, I, I'm, films are not repairing. Films are offering the best they can not to hurt, but to be with, I think, for me. Yeah, me too. There are ways of dreaming and going into other worlds, you know? But I, I got I, I got to mention you know the film No Fear No Die which I love very much and Isaac de Bancolé of course with Alex Descas who you've worked with both of them a lot and I really I know them I got to work a lot with Isaac and and twice with Alex and uh, I love that film so much and that's a film about outsiders coming from uh, Benin Benin and. Uh, 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 the character uh, 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 interpreted by Isa come from Benin. Benin. And, and, but the difference, Alex, is coming, coming from the Caribbean where he learned cockfighting. Right, Martinique. Martinique, yeah. Once I was, wa uh, Alex and I used to walk through Paris at night uh, endlessly, and we had many walks just for hours and hours. And one time, we came upon, upon a very violent scene where there were two guys um, beating up another guy. And we have no idea what caused this. And, Al and Alex was like, uh, two against one, that's not right. And he's going in there. I had to physically pull him back because it, it, it's a kind of ethics for him. And that wasn't right. And then I was like, Alex, you don't know. Maybe that guy did something terrible. And then as we were walking away, I said to him, you kind of reminded me of Claire there. Oh. And, he said, and he said, I know what you mean. She would have gone right in there. <laughs> no. <laughs> she says no, no but I, I've seen her do stuff no, like that. I mean, I, I would have sent someone. <laughs> <laughs> Alex. <laughs> Alex, yeah. you go in there. Isaac. <laughs> I'm not brave, but I... Yeah. But you say you're not funny, and then if you look at a film like um, Let the Sun Shine In. Oh, yeah. It's very funny. I was laughing so much through that. And another thing, like Juliette is able to play these misguided characters that have problems that they're not able to see, and she expresses things with the most minute reactions on her face. Like, just amazing. But... Really, I was laughing throughout that film, and it's kind of bleak, you know. It's not a pretty story, but she, it's, but it's in the, it's what you, you know, you yeah. made something very funny within that film. I, I remember uh, Olivier, the producer, told me, "Oh, Claire, why don't you adapt Fragment d'un discours amoureux by Bart, Roland Bart?" And I told him, "Oh no, Olivier, I can't because when I was reading those." I was maybe 20 and I was crying all the time because I felt I fit in every fragment. Every, every chapter was mine, you know? And it's, 
it's not fun, you know. It's like waiting in a bar for someone who is never coming, being abandoned. By, you know, I mean, like all the disaster of love, you know. Yeah. And I said, no, no, no. And then we decide, I work with Christine Ongo that time, and we decide to make the, our fragment with Juliette as the main character. And, and when you take a distance of the worst stories, then it become really a little bit caricatural, but very funny. And we were laughing a lot, you know. And I think Juliette has this capacity of being always on edge of the drama and but knowing exactly where to change the, the gear, to move the gear and go push on the other side. Just like that, I was amazed by by her, you know. She's, I, 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 she's amazing. <laughs> I never met her before except last night. I met her and I was talking to her and I was trying to, you know, be funny at times. And she, a few times she just looked at me like, that's not a good joke, you know. <laughs> she wouldn't say anything, but she's a little intimidating in that way. She's a very strong person. <laughs> she's very strong. And the way she laughs, she has such an enormous laugh, you know. You can hear it from two blocks away, you know. <laughs> ha. And she's a, she's a painter, she, she's a gardener, you know. She's, she's strong. She's just cool. I yeah, mean, yeah, let's hear cool. it for her. But talking about Isaac and Chocolat, and you filmed in Africa, you filmed Beau Travail, but you filmed White Material, which is an incredible film to me. And Isaac's character is very, very important in that mm -hmm. film. Um, can you say a little bit about where that came from? Because that's not adapted from anything. No. The, the thing is, I, um, I was having a conversation with Isabelle Huppert, and she said, oh, Claire, maybe you should really adapt a, a South African novel. And I told her, um, no, 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 no. South Africa is a very special place in the world, you know. You cannot, I don't, I've been only once, and, and it has nothing to do with the rest, because uh, apartheid, create something different. Colonialism is one thing, apartheid, it's another thing, you know. And not worse, not better, but it splits something like a scar, you know. Um, anyway, and I, I was reading newspaper and there was at that time, Isaac knows, uh, 2004, a sort of civil war in Ivory Coast between North and South, uh, Mus Muslim, Christian. I mean, and the French army was there flying with helicopter and asking <clears throat> the French people who stayed uh, in Ivory Coast uh, cultivating cacao. And they said, the French army is here to help you to leave your plantation. You have to go. You cannot stay. It's dangerous, blah, blah, blah. And one day I was watching the news on TV, and I saw this old French guy in this cacao trees what, looking at the, at the helicopter, and he was doing this, you know, like. And it was a little bit ridiculous, and yet very pathetic, you know. I thought this guy probably has no else, no other place to go. He was not young. I thought, uh, where can he go, you know? And I, I start to write the script from that, you know. The thing is, it's, we could not, of course, shoot in Ivory Coast. And I wanted to shoot in Ghana. 
And after some location scouting, I found out that the coffee plantation, because I wanted to shoot in a coffee plantation where not in good shape in Ghana, because gold was, the economy was different. And we find some great place in uh, West Cameroon. And that's where we went. And yeah. And, and Isabel Huppert is amazing in that film too, I gotta say. What, yeah. And what now she's on stage and she's in the Chekhov play La Cerisette, Cherry Tree Orchard. Uh, and one evening she told me, how strange, I never realized there is a connection between me in white material and cherry tree. Like um, someone who is um, losing a property, a woman losing a property and not understanding why, as if she was not realizing that, I mean, in Cherry Tree, she is not, she's broke, but she's not understanding the world is changing, actually. Does it happen to you, it happens to me, when people tell you things they saw in your film, a film of yours, that you were not conscious of, and then when they tell you, when they tell me, I'm like, oh, yeah but I didn't, wasn't aware before, you know, and sometimes you want to just play it off. And yeah, I thought, I thought that up. <laughs> I don't, though, because I don't, I'm always amazed by, to me, anyone who sees any film sees a different thing because we're all different, you know. It's why I don't feel comfortable being on juries of film festivals, really, because I don't really understand a group decision on something that moves everyone else in a different yeah, way. Yeah. But I, I love it when people see things that are in the film, but I wasn't really conscious of them. And again, I, I'm not analytical. I don't want to be. I don't know where things come from. But does that happen to you, where they in, you know, reveal something you weren't really aware of, but makes sense to you? Completely. I'm, I'm aware of nothing. You know, I, I, uh, It's true. There is something... Probably I'm, I'm, I love the idea that the film is driving me and that it's obscure in a way, you know. Um, I know things about the film. I can do location scouting. I can do, but I know there is something very obscure always and it's helping me because if I was, Analyzing the film, I would be a way I wouldn't be able to raise in the morning, I guess, that I would be afraid. Well, I think it's our, our approach to filmmaking. I mean, there are people who storyboard everything. There's like the sort of Hitchcock formulas of films that are you know, beautiful machines in their way, but what, what, how boring it would be to make them that way, I think. But, you know, you are very, you know, you make your films in the, I, I get the feeling it's what I aspire to do, is shooting a film is capturing the stuff from which you will construct it in the editing room. And, and films are constructed, it's very delicate, like how you, you can change a shot or move something in the film, a tiny thing. The thing I learned is that when you're in the beginning and you have a rough cut of a film, making big changes in the edit affect the film in a small way. But when you get the film toward being a tight edit, making a tiny change affects the film in a big way. And exactly. it's very mysterious, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And you have to sort of let it tell you at least in our case, because we're not making a formula. Do you think that filmmaking, this is probably a terrible question, but do you think making films the way we do is more aligned in a way with like poetry than prose in a certain way where the spaces between things, and maybe that's not a good analogy, but again, I don't know what the question is. Help. I, I think the way you make film, um, I'm sure, is also 
so much related to poetry because you um, you not only like the character, you like the the, the actor or actress who represent those characters. And that's, I, sh I see that so much in your film. And I think, for me, it's the most important, you know? The way you consider the actor or the actress or the musician, the music, so important that nothing else matter in a way, you know? Just even the frame is there to magnify the, the, the relation you have with those. I, I remember working with you um, in the bayou in New Orleans. Well, I love I remember that the way uh, you were framing those guys and those women uh, it, it's still so vivid in me, you know? But, well, your films are very much about details and things, too, so much. Like, I remember after I saw uh, Vendredi Soir, Friday night, someone asked me a few days later, so what, what did you think about the film? What was it about to you? And I said, it's about the texture of a bedspread. It's about skin and under a lamplight in a hotel. I don't know. It's, it was about all these little kind of sensual details that were left with me more than the story. I know what the story was, but it wasn't what I, the film, it wasn't what I was carrying, you know? I was carrying a lot of nuances of things that are, I don't know. Maybe me too. Me too. I knew it was one night during the strike, and in France we know a lot about strikes, and, but that's the meeting of two characters, that's it, you know, and cars. One funny thing, just about a total aside about French and Paris and strikes, once I was in a really big traffic jam in Paris, and when the police were trying to get through, everyone was just blocking them. <laughs> and then when the firemen wanted to get through, they all opened up and let them go. Wow. And I was like, why, why do you do that? I don't like the, we don't like the cops. <laughs> <laughs> it was very yeah. Parisian. Yeah. <laughs> it's anyway. true, it's true. I and firemen that. in France are very different because they do all kinds of jobs. They, yeah. they, they come to your house if there's problems. So, you know, it's yeah. a different thing. It is. Here we just call cops, and if you're black, they shoot you. you know. Every little Not boy really in funny, France is it? wants to be a fireman. I love pompier. If someone's yeah, injured, pompier. they come, they take them, they do all kinds mm -hmm. of things. They're really great. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I wanted to talk to you, too, about you just mentioned music, and you've worked with Stuart from Tinder Sticks on many films, and yeah. I, I got to meet him once with you, hang out with him a little, but he is a, he's a remarkable element in the films that you've collaborated with. He adds a kind of emotional thing that's not, it's never telling you what to feel, it's not like forcing it on you, it's just sort of underlying or sketching some emotional thing that's sort of ethereal, but He's an important collaborator to, to you. Yeah, it's very important because he's not analyzing, he's just feeling this or that, you know? And it's his in own interpretation, you know? And he's a very stubborn man, so I... It's good that I, <laughs> I like everything. I remember when we were doing 35 Shots of Rome, I told him, there's no music in that film. I, I have the, the right for Night Shift by Commodores, and that's all I need. And Just run it wall to wall. And, <laughs> and, he, and he, he came in the editing room with music and said, if you can use that, you know, it's, it's 
<laughs> the, the key on, on the... And it fit completely the film, you know? I don't know, it's very... St and you know the thing with Stuart, it comes from Nottingham. His English accent is so horrible. I, I mean, horrible, no, it's beautiful, but I don't understand half of what he's telling me. He lives in France, doesn't speak a word of French. <laughs> His four children speak fluent French. His wife speaks fluent French. He cannot. And he doesn't understand my English. So we are, in a, it's the perfect way of collaboration, you know? Yes, yeah, Stuart Staples, he, he's, his band is called Tinder Sticks. But yeah, he writes beautiful things for Claire. And you also, collect, we mentioned Agnès Godard, but you've also worked a lot writing with Jean-Paul. Paul Fargeau. Yes, yeah. so you worked with him uh, over many years too. Yeah, I met him a long time ago in Marseille. And we became friends. And when I start working on Chocolat, I, I invite him um, to, I went to Marseille, we worked together. We, I took him to Cameroon and it was, it's a great relation. We still, in, I mean, friend and we still have some project. I mean, I, it's not true, I don't have project. <laughs> no, I mean, it's not possible to have project. I mean, unless it's real, you know. Um, but it, I still hope a, a, this kind of friendship, when you like to work with someone, it's good to believe it will never end. Yeah. You've, you really like writers and books, and I know that when you were young, very young, you started reading, reading, when you were little even, and uh, is there, I'm just curious, is there anything you remember, like early things you read that really you carried with you, Jules Verne or anything, like what, do you remember things that were really important to you when you were young, before you made films? I was reading, especially I was stealing my mother's book, and she was completely uh, intoxicated by a collection of, um, uh, how do you call it, uh, black novel, police, um, crime fiction, crime fiction. Série, noire. Série Noire. And um, I remember, of course, it was not allowed, she, she would never allow me to read it, but I was stealing those. And I remember Chester Himes when I was maybe nine years old, ten years old, and I couldn't believe stories like that could exist, you know? It was uh, the, describing New York in such a way, you know, never existed before. Or, I remember uh, in the Série Noire there were two Dashiell Hammett short stories. I was amazed too. Because this, for me, it was a, a sort of pure um, literature. There was no, um, you didn't, it was not demanding admiration and respect. It was just telling you something with a certain brutality, you know? I, I was crazy about that, you know? And it, it kept, still today, I think, I still, I still have the, almost a complete collection of Serre Noir, you know? I, yes, I loved it. We're know? moving uh, apartments and I, my collection of crime fiction paperbacks is huge. I was so proud that I have them. Yeah. But this kind of, you use the word brutality, and I remember, I think it's right, the first sentence of Dashiell Hammett's masterpiece, Red Harvest, just sounds brutal. The two cops smoking and unshaved. 
Yeah. Some but the, like that. No, but there's a sentence about the first time I heard Personville called Poisonville, Poisonville. was from a red-haired muck named Hickey Dewey. Yeah. And it's just like, that's just brutal in your mouth to even say, you know? I, I, I remember, I think, a novel, maybe it, it's not Red Harvest, it's Dane Curse. The Dane Curse. The Dane Curse. And it started, the first sentence is, Hi, the detective is driving, in, is speaking in the first person. He sees two cops entering Poisonville, <laughs> or Bay City, I don't know, Poisonville probably. And he says, those two cops were smoking and unshaved. <laughs> Coma, it, it, it started not so good. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and this, I, it's always there. I think it's really the way of the setting beginning. the world. Yeah. yeah, amazing. Oh, yeah. I love And shaved and smoking, you know, it's going to be terrible. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's going downhill from it, here. But there's a sentence. I like Mickey Spillane's kind of brutal yeah, language. And yeah. there's a sentence in one book that's uh, the head is only connected to the body by a very thin thread of a neck. <laughs> Which is just like brutal, you know? <laughs> exactly. But. This is, and then of course, uh, then high school and literature and poetry, but I kept attached to this entering into, by a fraction, into books. And for me, it's really important. And then maybe I have to say, I, I feel a bit ashamed to say that, but I think when I start reading uh, William Faulkner in English, which is rather difficult for a French person. Well, it's for an English reader. <laughs> Not that easy. But Those I sentences was, are long, you know. Yeah, but it's, I was amazed. But we it. both love especially the Wild Palms, oh, the spoke yeah, of Faulkner. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Mm. And and also light in August. I mean, I felt so as if uh, I was um, a f transverse. I, I I mean, I felt something in his writing that is really. Um, the pure, um, how maybe I should say pain, yeah, pain. Um, how to describe what is painful is the way it does it. I don't know. It's amazing for me, and it's it's not psychological. It's not. It's just there, you know. I, I admire that a lot. Um, I didn't realize till recently that you were an assistant director to Dusan Makaveyev on the film Sweet Movie. Yeah. That must I have was been a, interesting. I was, a, <laughs> I was not even an assistant. I was still in film school and I was a PA, I mean, huh? and uh, director of the school who was also, what had been a director, a film director, and he was very, he, he, he was a communist, and he had problem making film in the 70s, and, but he was a great director of the film school, and he brought all those great DP, like Henri Alcan, who, were also, who was also a communist, and uh, Pierre Lhomme, Henri Alcan shot films for uh, Cocteau, but he also shot with Vim Vendors, yeah. uh, the Skies Over Berlin. What, yeah, um, and uh, the one he made called? in Portugal. Oh, yes, uh, The State of Things. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I don't think... Yeah, I, State of Things. Did yeah. he shoot? Mm -hmm. And also uh, Sacha Vierny, working with... All those guys were almost out of work because of their reputation to be communist, you know? I mean, and it's because of Jean Eustache that Pierre Lhomme started 
to work again, you know. I mean, and that school was rich of this feeling of um, special people. So he sent me as a PA on Dushan Makaveyev. Uh, it was a great experience. <laughs> I was so amazed. I couldn't believe I was. It, it was like a, a science fiction movie. I was in an, another world, completely another world, you know. Well, even now, it's a difficult film to even categorize, you know? It's his own kind yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. But you also worked uh, on Hana K, the Costa Gravas film. Yeah, yeah. What did you do? Were you a production I was assistant? An, no, no, I was a, an assistant director. A, a professional assistant director, yeah. It was wow. not just sent by school. No, and we were shooting in Israel with Gabriel Byrne. Uh, I mean, it was, uh, I was very, it's a very strange memory because I was, it was written, uh, it was before the first Intifada, but already Israel was uh, uh, harsh. It was, and I was feeling, I was not afraid, but I, the war was still going on in Lebanon. And I was in a, I was feeling all that violence everywhere, and I was a little bit, it was changing my vision, my, uh, it was opening a new vision of something that exists as today. We are all, um, I, I mean, we are all, because it's true, I, we were, I was slowly falling asleep in COVID-19, and suddenly this war in Ukraine woke me up, you know, I said, oh, you know, it's still there, you know, COVID has not put us asleep completely, you know. Wearing a mask, getting a vaccination, it's not the most important thing. Something else is happening. I was like, oh. And still today, while I'm speaking to you, I, I'm i not afraid. I am horrified, <laughs> you know. I don't know. I have no word to express that as if. So COVID has not stopped everything. Well, I wake up with anxiety about just environmental collapse yeah, and, uh, yeah. you know, racism, um, wars, territories, nationalism aren't going to mean shit if yeah. there's no water or food yeah. or, you know, so yeah. I get very traumatized by it. I'm <coughs> trying to appreciate, as Warren Zevon said, you know, appreciate, enjoy every sandwich. But I try to just appreciate the details of having a consciousness because the thing that, the machine that broke it ain't going to fix it. And that's no. obvious no, now. No, no. So it's very sad to me and I don't know. But anyway, yeah. I'm happy to be here appreciating, you know, Claire's work and all these gifts and what she's put in my consciousness. So, <laughs> you know, that's a good thing we're here. Just you said something yesterday that, makes me rich. You said everybody speaks about those refugees from Ukraine, which of course need to be rescued. And But it's true that for years now, people have been crossing the Mediterranean Sea on rubber boat, dying in the middle of the Mediterranean. Um, arriving half dead in Greece or Sicily, and nobody want them, you know? Yeah. And because they are not white yeah. and not Christian. Exactly. And it's terrifying. Or if you see it's genocide tried. in Rwanda or you see what's in Syria, mm. you know, uh, the corporate media doesn't give it that attention. Yeah. But it's a good thing they give attention to, to the Ukraine. I'm not of saying, course, and my uh, heart me, me, is me with... Yeah everyone there and my heart is with the young russian soldiers that 
don't even want to be there. You oh, know, they, they can't even call their mom, you know. They yeah. thought they're on a training mission, so what are they going to do? They're running out of food. They're going to go steal food from some Ukrainian household, and the housewife's going to shoot them. And it's like, what a nightmare for yeah, everyone, nightmare everyone, for everyone, everyone, you yeah. know, it's horrifying. Yeah, it's horrifying. And yeah. I always remember William Blake saying, you know, always keep your heart with the soldiers on either side because they're not the cause of this, you know. Yeah. So I try to keep that in mind. But, yeah, uh, yeah it's, a, it's a very horrifying thing, a brutality of these megalomaniacal they're like little testosterone poisoned boys with their toys these assholes i'm sorry no but this authoritarianism i think is a deficit there's something wrong with these people there's something wrong with them but what happens they get rewarded with all the power you know so Anyway, uh, we, no, I'm sorry we're going. No, you're completely right. Sorry we're going back. No, no, we, you're right. I agree, I agree. Yeah. And, and in I America s- especially, if you are the most greedy, fucking self-centered narcissist, you win, you know? If you're a lying fucking criminal, you get the reward. Anyway, I, it's, no, sorry. But, yeah, you're completely right. It is... Um, you know, when I was doing Beau Travail, I was shooting in Djibouti, and I thought, the, I, I was, I had absolutely no idea the foreign agent didn't want me to do the film, so they start pushing up away, pushing away, they, they try to stop the movie. But in the meantime, the only place where I could meet with real legionnaire was the nightclub because this that's the only place they could go at the end of the day and they could tell me about the training and everything and I remember until today I think I felt so uh, I was the most um, honest <laughs> uh, person I would never um, made a, a film dishonest about those young guys who were uh, in the foreign legend because they had nowhere else to go. I was feeling for them a lot, you know. I love in high life too, they're in space, but they're, pr- they're really just in prison too, yeah. you know, it's really yeah. interesting. Who else would like to go? <laughs> All right, it's time for a bad yeah. joke after this stuff. I'm going to tell you a bad joke. A guy sure. goes to his psychiatrist. He's been going to him for a long time. The guy's freaked out. He's kind of unbalanced guy. He walks in. The psychiatrist is on the other side of the room. And he says, hey, what, what's, what's the deal? What's the problem? You know, he, ha- he got an emergency session. And the guy says, you've got to help me. You've got to help me, man. I'm covered with centipedes and insects and creatures and they're still crawling all over me what do i do and the psychiatrist said well stay over there man i don't want to get them all over me (laughs) very bad joke just no it is true (laughs) it is true exactly and does anyone have questions in our our wonderful audience or I mean I have more I can talk I can ask nonsense all night do films occupy a spiritual thing in your life me Uh, I don't know I cannot answer that because I don't know it's something I'm not sure I can really uh, put there is probably some roots of spirituality in my life because I was raised like that, but I would not say some, that it's, I deliberately think of it when I'm, no, no. Yeah, I would say the same. I would just say that for me, my religion, I mean, I'm, technically an atheist right but my religion is of the imagination because i think human capabilities whether 
it's scientists or artists or inventors or architects you know they the imagination is the thing that fuels what 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 i think the most important things humans offer comes from so i wouldn't equate it with spirituality per se but it's to me the most valuable thing humans have you know and the least valuable thing they have is being human centric i think i'm just getting very tired of just humans thinking well anyway that's when when that's another thing i think when when i think of your question i think there is a very something very strong with music that you can share immediately and you made me listen great music and so this is something also immediate you know yeah man we got to go to bam last week to see mudu mokhtar um play and i hadn't seen live music for a while and it was ecstatic it was uh -huh. like um getting so high from just receiving that music from you know there he's from niger and it's that tuareg desert electric yeah. blues thing it's just it was yeah. just ethereal you know that was like for me an ecstatic you know the people the people i was with said wow we just went to church you know yeah i agree yeah very simple when i wrote the script at the very beginning the title was fire it was just a working title you know and there was a reason in the script and i changed the script i cut a scene and then stuart wrote a song for the film both side of the blade and because the french title is avec amour et acharnement and I could not translate it completely in English. I thought, well, both sides of the blade is the best translation of avec amour et acharnement. So I don't know now the distribution here. They will decide, and um, we will discuss that. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Claire. Yeah. Uh.